and where it being steps, lighter and lighter, it will swim across the surface of the plate. And you can see this pattern that looks like this. And of course, where it gets nearer the center, the steps are heavier. And if it gets farther away, they get lighter. Because those are only the fast swimmers. Okay, so remember, steps observed on an auger plate is also a way of detecting motility, and I use that in one of the midterm questions. Love it! <laughs> All right. So, what if you don't have a paddle? You remember how your mother said, don't do that, you'll be upstream without a paddle. Uh-uh. You are said to be a trichus. When we talk about how many flagella a bacteria has, we say they're monotrichus, amphitrichus, logotrichus, peritrichus, or atrichus. Remember, in English, the root word is what we're talking about. What's trichus mean? Paddle. What's A before anything? Without. Without. So, bacteria that are non-modal on your record, if you're discussing it, you want to seem intelligent. But seeming is a whole lot better than being. All right? If you want to use the word not non-modal or doesn't have a flagella, you want to say it was detected as a trichus by the following test. See, it makes you sound so much smarter. All right. All right, how many, ba how many little paddles you have and where they're located help you identify the bacteria. And then there is one other thing. There's always a weirdo, isn't there? Yeah. Come on, you know there's always a weirdo. You went to Sunday school. You got in there, you know, there's normal people. And then there's the weirdo. There's always a weirdo. And there is bacteria that have an inside flagellum. The flagella's inside the bacteria. Is that not weird? It's called an endoflagella. And it's the... One of the most famous microbes that we love to hate, Treptonema pallidum, that causes syphilis, is a spirochete. Remember, a spirochete is shaped like a corkscrew, but it has an internal flagella connected at both ends. And what it does is it's just like a spring or a slinky. Push it together and then suddenly let it loose. It'll go through the liquid in a spiral pattern and then it will contract and let loose and go through again. So it's modal by an internal flagella called an endo, endoflagella. Now, you know I'm tricky and evil. That's my job, to make sure you know how to think, make your own decisions, and to prove it to myself by being tricky and evil. And so you'll notice that I put this in bright red so I'm going to say Tryptonema pallidum, those people that were here and listened know that that's a spirochete, is modal by means of A, cat, B, dog, C, car, D, axial filament, E, none of these is correct. Most of you will pick, and in the past have always picked. None of these is correct because they were looking for endoflagella. But what's the synonym to it? Axial filament. I just didn't make it red. So nobody read. <laughs> By the way, one of the answers to our midterm is going to be cat. <laughs> just want you to know. I'm going to say the abbreviation for the catalase test, or no, the abbreviation. Why make it that easy? Let's be a little bit tricky. The abbreviation for the test that detects whether or not your microbe can survive in an oxygen atmosphere is called Whoa. A, dog, B, cat. Cat's the right answer. Catalyst test. <laughs> oh, yes. I'll get that cat one in there. Yes. So what is it? Tripod. Tripod. Can you say that again? Yes. Tryptonema pallidum. Trypto what? Just remember tryptonema. Tryptonema pallidum is what causes syphilis. That's the scientific name. Remember, scientific names are always underlined. Genus is capitalized, species is not. 
and it causes the sip. Siplish. And it is a spirochete, which is modal by internal endoflagella or axial filament. So you serious about the cat test? Yes. But cat is not a test catalase. I, I say, what's the abbreviation for the cat abbreviation? Yeah. So I have to start paying attention to those animal questions from now on. <laughs> All right. And we already talked about what's the technique that describes how flagella can be stained? Who remembers? That's right. And why don't we do it? Yeah, it takes like three hours to do the darn thing. All right, moving boringly onward. What are the different kinds of flagella? If you have one flagella at one end, you're boring. And you're called monotony. No, I mean monotony. Oh, monotrichus. If you're ambidextrous, one at each end, you're amphitrichous. If you have any other combination, one or more, at two or both ends, you're lofo. You're lofo trichus. All right? And if you have little ones all the way around the outside, remember that's peri, peri trichus. So it's easy to remember these, and now you just have gotten Five multiple choice questions that are going to be on the midterm. One more time. Why? It's not hard. These are the flagella. How many they have? If they got one, they're all mono. If they got two, one at each end, ampy, like ambidextrous. If they have two or more at one or both ends, it's local trigger. Directly from the notes. You don't have to write anything down. All right, so what else is different? Yeah. So the, when they have two coming out of like the same side? If they have two coming out of one end, yeah. they're lofo. Okay. All right, so remember we're talking about flagella. And remember, there are two major kinds of cells, those that have, are gram-negative and gram-positive. And the, uh, the difference between gram-negative and gram-positive is the gram-negatives have two membranes and a thin peptidoglycan layer, and the gram-positives have one super thick uh, cell wall and a plasma membrane. Now, when you're thinking about waving something, you're going to wave something. Does my arm wave me, or do I wave the arm? I'm waving it, so it's got to be anchored somewhere. So the anchors in flagella are called basal bodies. And anchors is always anchored in two spots, within the membrane and between the membrane and the wall. So, of course, gram-positives would have two. How many would gram-negatives have, basal bodies? Four. They've got two membranes. One in the plasma membrane, one between the plasma membrane and the cell wall. One between the cell wall and the outer membrane, and one in the outer membrane. So, the anchors for the flagella, and the last thing about flagella that I'm going to tell you, there's, this is the anchor. How do you know it's gram positive? It just has two anchors. One in the plasma membrane, one between the plasma membrane and the cell wall. This is gram negative. Four anchors. One in the plasma membrane, one between the plasma membrane and the cell wall, one between the cell wall and the outer membrane, and one in the outer membrane. Four. All right, so one last thing I want to tell you about flagella. In bacteria, it's one protein fiber. <laughs> in your cells, there's that nine plus two arrangement of all flagella. Very complicated. In bacteria, it's just a protein fibril, one. 
not nine strands surrounding two, like in your cell. So the flagella in bacteria is a very simple protein strand. All right, the next thing that we're going to look at is dirty porn. You know, most of the girls don't like porn, do they? No, I mean, here we go. We're going to look at porn, bacterial pornography. Don't look now, but they're doing the nasty right there on the screen. Yep. Nasty, nasty, nasty. Yep, right there. All right. So here's some rules about sex in bacteria. It's not called sex. So if your daughter or nephew or niece comes to you and says, me and my boyfriend, we're going out tonight and we're going to do some conjugate. It's not verbs they're doing. It's sex. Conjugation means sex in bacteria, and it can mean sex in anything. And so uh, we don't call it bacterial sex, we call it bacterial conjugation. And there are some general rules, just like your mama told you, okay. where things are supposed to go. All right, conjugation in bacteria, one, usually happens only in gram negatives. I, we don't know what gram positives do for fun. <laughs> but we do know that most of the conjugation happens in gram negatives. We also know that a large amount of DNA is moved, up to 51 genes. So you're going to be asked later on, which of the ways of horizontal gene transfer, remember this is horizontal, but you have to get horizontal to do sex. Well, most people don't. It's very strenuous. Uh, but anyway, Horizontal gene transmission, which way moves the most genes? Conjugation moves 51 at maximum. And what kind of bacteria have conjugation? Gram negatives Gram mostly. Now, just like in people, there are ho hos and racists. We have a bacteria that will have sex with anything. So, uh, Streptococcus is a bacteria that will have sex not only in its own genus its own species, between other species, Streptococcus has even been known to have sex in other domains. They will have sex with an elephant if it walks through the room and gets close enough. Streptococcus is a slut. Now what's the difference between a slut and a hoe? A hoe gets paid. They don't get paid. It's a slut. <laughs> All right? Then there is racist bacteria. Who the racist? I'm sorry, I don't call sex or even associated with anybody that is not exactly like me. And that's Neisseria. Neisseria won't have sex with any other microbe except the same genus and the same species. So you know how boring that is? What if you're having sex with something that looks exactly like you and has every characteristic you do? Racists are very dull. Alright, so let's talk about, yeah. And mycoplasma. And mycoplasma. You saw that video? No, you were Oh, from the other one? Okay. There's a video. Right? <laughs> oh, man, I was hoping you were fabulously ahead or something. All right, so anyway, let's talk about how sex happens in bacteria. A bacteria, usually a gram negative, that runs across another bacteria. And remember that all bacteria have their own chromosome. But some bacteria have what we call extra chromosomal DNA outside the chromosome that is 10 to 50 genes long. And one of these kinds, there's 36 different kinds of plasmids, extra chromosomal DNA is called a plasmid. And there are 36 different kinds we've discovered so far. One of these plasmids is called an F plasmid. And the F plasmid has the F gene on it. And I'm going to tell you what F stands for. It's root. But any plasmid that has an F gene, when it comes across another cell that doesn't have a plasmid with the F gene, it forms this hollow conjugation tube called a conjugation pili. One is a pilus. If they did it more than one, it'd be pili. Now, in microbiology currently, the word pili is now reserved for sex, while the hollow tube protein tube used for holding on or breathing through is called a fimbra. 
They used to interchangeably use it. So you used to see, and you may still see a book say, conjugation fimbrite. Just remember, now the word is pilot. Try to keep the vocabulary separate. And remember that any cell that has a that has an F gene is called F positive. If you don't have an F gene, you're said to be H negative. And the moment that one detects the other one, the F plasmid makes a copy of itself. And the little hollow tube forms. And this plasmid goes through the hollow tube. And the first gene that goes through is the F gene. So that after sex is over, the F negative cell is now F positive because it has a plasmid with the F gene. They would both be males become, I mean females become male after sex. This is called male and this is called female. And once it has the F gene, it is now F positive or male. But we don't like to use the word male and female because it confuses people and they get all wanting to go out and congregate. It's disgusting. All right, so here's some interesting things about it. Um, we have used conjugation a tremendous amount. It, we used it to map genes. To know what a gene does, we can send a wave through here, remember, and it will break the conjugation pylon. So we can send a wave just after it's passed a gene and then watch the cell and see how it changes and know what that gene codes for. So it's used in gene mapping. It's also very important in the evolutionary process of gram negatives. Gram negatives have changed over billions of years by moving 51 genes or more. Now, if there's only a maximum of 50 on a plasmid, how can you move 51? And remember, there's another method of gene transfer called translocation that says that a gene from the chromosome can move to the plasmid and vice versa. So if a plasmid, the maximum we can get is 50, remember you can also get 51 because of translocation. How do we do this gene mapping? Remember, bacteria are conjugating in a liquid environment. All you have to do is send a wave through there and it breaks the pilot. Pilots. Any questions about that and bacteria? All right. So this is an external structure that forms a hollow protein tube used for exchanging DNA. And it's called a conjugation pilus. If it's one or conjugation pili, if there's more than one. Let's say that I went home tonight and I made some wonderful chicken and rice soup. My mother, every time I go home, she makes chicken and rice soup. She goes out and gets one of those, and I'll scrap the chicken with a lot of fat on it and all this, you know, so it's really strong chicken taste. And I don't know how she does it because when I copy her recipe, mine turns into chicken and mushy rice paste. Hers turns into chicken with nice rice. And mine, all the liquid of the soup is absorbed into the rice, which becomes concrete, you know. <laughs> but anyway, so every time I go home, she knows that when I arrive, I know she's going to have made my soup. Chicken and rice soup. I know it's waiting for me when I arrive at four hours from the airport. And I get in, I heat it up, and sometimes I forget to put it back in the refrigerator. And so if the next day is warm and we come back and look, oh gosh, you forgot the chicken and rice soup, you will see that there is a scum across the top of the rice soup. It's not fat. She scoops that all off because she doesn't want me to die of heart attack. It is a whole bunch of bacteria that have fallen from the air and reproduced, and they're holding on to the meniscus, the air water interface, in the chicken soup. Why? They're from the air. They're aerobic. They have to have air. So if they fall into the soup and eat the soup and reproduce, they're going to continue fall, falling with gravity to the bottom and suffocate. 
So they hold on with a little hollow tube that they breathe through, making a scum of fimbri called a pellicle. <coughs> so when hundreds of thousands of bacteria are holding on to the top of a liquid so that they don't sink because they're aerobic, it's called a pellicle. And these bacteria holding on is called a fimbri. Now, fimbri is one of our first structures that we're going to talk about today that makes a bacteria more dangerous. Why? Because they're used for holding on. And how do you, you know, if you don't want something to attach to you, what do you usually do? You try to shake it off. Well, bacteria, when you're exposed to them, often don't attach unless they have fembrin. And so fembrin make bacteria more dangerous. Remember, um, the most famous of the bacteria that use fembrin is gonorrhea. Gonorrhea is a fun organism. We often call it the clap. It's a very nice sexually transmitted disease. It's a gram-negative diplococci with fembrin. Now, in epidemiology, which is the study of who get who, where, why, and what, the disease you caught, and how you caught it, there is a concept called MID. And that stands for minimum infectious dose. How many of these microbes does it take for you to get infected? I'm sorry folks, despite what Fox News says, the answer is not ever one. You know, there are hysterical news agencies that say, oh my god, we found one of these. One is not an MID. In fact, most diseases, it takes hundreds of thousands of them for to overwhelm your body's immune system and the conditions that prevent infection. So let's talk about the conditions that cause infection. Number one condition that allows you to get infected from something, to get a disease, is it's got to come from somewhere. It's got to come from an infected person. You can't drive through San Francisco with your windows down and someone throw in AIDS. <laughs> You've got to get it from someone who has it. So remember, to get an infection, you got to have a host. You can't just go to an area of the world and say, oh, I went there, I've got it. You've got to get it from a host. And then, remember, it's got to get out of the host, which is called an exit portal. So, to get an infection, you've got to have a host that has it with enough microbes to infect another person. So, for instance, let's talk about HIV. In Europe, if you have HIV and you get the medications and your viral load in your blood is undetectable by all chemical means, that's what we, when someone says, I have HIV but I'm undetectable, meaning that every machine and every test we can run shows it isn't there. Then in Europe, they say you don't, you, you are not legally responsible for infecting anyone if you don't use a condom. In other words, in this country, if you're HIV positive and you know you're HIV positive and you have sex with someone who is HIV negative and they're infected, that is a crime because you knew it. But in Europe, if you're undetectable and you have sex with someone, you don't have to inform them and you don't have to get, use a condom because it is impossible to be infected if there isn't enough to reach the MID. And what does it take? It takes over 250,000 particle, viral particles per mil to infect a person with HIV. So if you have 70, you're not going to infect someone. Yeah? Um, then if it's not detectable in the first place, how do they know that they have HIV? Because you will always have a positive uh, antibody test if you're ever infected with anything. That's why you can't lie on any of those forms that says, have you ever had this? You can't say no, because if they get a blood test, all they have to do is run an antibody screen and see if you've ever had it. So even though the antibodies will say that you are HIV positive, the will say you are HIV positive. It will say you don't have infectious particles. Oh, I see. 
to the detectable level of the machine. The machine now can read down to it's less than 2,000 particles. All right, so anyway, that's why you get controversial literature. Do you remember that guy that, who was that crazy whack job that ran for president like 200 times in a row? He lived, no. <laughs> now this guy was, he was from California and he had a very controversial platform that said everybody should be tested for AIDS and anyone that was found to be positive for HIV should be quarantined. Does anybody remember him? Is he like the adventure of the seatbelt? Hmm? Is he the one who enforced the seatbelt and stuff like that? Yeah, I forgot his name. He was on one of these weird parties. But anyway. Um, no, but it was at the same time. Anyway, he put out some literature, of course. Anybody can put out literature about who, how to get and prevent the spread of HIV. And in his literature, he put a true statement, but he let, let people believe that something was possible that's not. And he put in, HIV has been found in every body fluid of someone who has an HIV infection and, and they didn't put who's not under control. In other words, who has, you know, that. In other words, he means someone that is not receiving treatment. Every body fluid you have has HIV in it. That's true. And he said, as a result, you should not do French kissing or long kissing with anyone unless you know their HIV status. That is not true. Why? Because there's not enough in saliva to infect a person. There is so little in saliva, even someone with a huge viral load has so little in saliva, it would take gallons of saliva. You'd have to slurp down gallons to get infected. And so it has never happened. But he wanted, you know, they, there are people that like to make things that are bad worse. Somehow they enjoy that. And so he said, it is theoretically possible to be infected from saliva. And that is true. What does theoretically mean? Mathematically possible. In mathematics, one makes anything possible. Only zero makes it not mathematically possible. So even though it's never happened in 60 million cases, and it won't happen to you, there are people saying it was, all based on MID, minimum infectious dose. So anyway, let's review. To get it infected by a disease, you've got to have a host. It's got to have an exit portal from that host, and it's got to exit in sufficient quantity to cause infection. Then it's got to travel the distance through the air, through whatever, to, in other words, it's got to be, it's got to travel the distance and maintain the infectious quantity. It's got to arrive at an uninfected entry portal, and it's got to arrive in enough quantity to infect a person, and it's got to be at a host set. And then finally, it's got to overwhelm your host defenses. So all of those things have to be correct for you to get infected, and how do we stop infection? We block one or two of those, and we've got it. That's what a condom does. A condom blocks the distance from a host to an entry portal. So anyway, why am I telling you all this? Because gonorrhea has the lowest MID almost of all things we've ever researched. The MID is approximately 4,000 bacteria. When you pick up a loop and you get as little as possible on there, you have more than 4,000. So this is a very strange disease because this is an extremely low MID. Most microbes are hundreds of thousands it takes to cause infection. This one, 4,000. Why? Membrane. The moment gonorrhea find a mucous membrane, they grab a hole. Just like a subway uh, <laughs> hanger there. And they just stay there. No matter what you do, there they are. And the only way you can get rid of them is antibiotics. Because the fembrite attach. So let's say that you had spring break. And you went to Daytona and you did 
a few things you shouldn't have, all because of that, you know, tequila. <laughs> you had two bottles of tequila, and you woke up two days later in a big pile of naked people. And you suddenly realized there were only two condoms on the floor, but there were 18 people. And you go, oh my god. And about 12 hours later, you feel a little, sort of a little jolt in your hee hee as you're walking. What was that? No, no. And you go urinate, and it burns a little bit. And each time you urinate after that, it burns more and more until it's like a red hot poker stuck in your urethra. And you scream. You go to bed at night, you go, please don't let me pee. I'm not drinking anything, so I don't pee. Because it really hurts. And the next morning you get up, and there are reddish. I mean, there are yellow-green dots on your underwear, which is pus coming out of your urethra. Ew. And you go for that, you know, wonderful first morning wee, yes. and nothing happens. You have to run. And out comes this clot of dried pus that is yellow and green, and you hear this person screaming hysterically, it's you! And you call up the STD clinic of the Los Angeles County Health Department, and of course it's never convenient. It's 2.45 on a Thursday, you know. You can't say you're taking a long lunch, and you can't get off that early, so you're going to have to tell it, your, you know, your boss, oh, I'm going to the STD, no, you don't say STD clinic, you just say, I have to go to the clinic, I have an appointment. And you get there, and everyone's wearing coats and dark glasses, and reading newspapers. I didn't even know that newspapers existed anymore. But everybody's got one. And you hear, number three, and somebody gets up and goes with their newspaper like this. And they take a little sample, and they smear it on a slide, and they do a gram stain. And if they find gram negative diplococci, they either give you an injection, or they get, if you can't take the antibiotic they give by injection, they will give you some cap capsules to take, and you take all of them goes away and you feel so much better and then a month or two later six months later you don't even want to remember you had gonorrhea except seven months later after having unprotected sex with your friend they call you up and said you won't believe this but I've got gonorrhea now you're not honest no one is you don't say oh my goodness I had that about Eight months ago, I wonder how you got it. <laughs> you say, oh my God, you slut! Who else have you been sleeping with besides me? And they say, no one! And you say, liar! <laughs> That's not true. You see, after you're cured, up to two years afterward, certainly in the first year, you have enough to infect another person in your reproductive tract. So even though you took, had it, took the medication to get rid of it, up to 4,000 remain for a, almost a year and a half to two years. So you could be completely cured and it be long in your forgotten past and you have unprotected sex with someone and you can give them gonorrhea because it has a very low what? Which is caused by? Membrane. Now, uh, did your daddy give you the uh, speech about the birds and the bees or your mama? Daddy, nobody gave you those speeches? Oh, that is so sad. That 